track right here. This is the railroad right of way. I see. This is the railroad right of way. Yes. All right. And you have determined who determined the point of impact. I did. You did. All right. And what is P2? That's the vehicle number two. What kind of vehicle is that? A pickup truck. A pickup truck? Yes. And what is this over here? It says the word tractor. That's the tractor which was towing the two bottom dumps. This is a portion of the semi-trailer of the first bottom dump, and this is a portion of the second, which is icy. Now, this vehicle was not damaged. Then P2, yes, it did have some damage on the left front. It did have some damage, yes. And this, of course, has the whole portion, yes. Okay, fine, thank you, officer. And just one last thing here. The pickup truck appears to be across or a straddle the center dividing line or what would have been the center dividing line on the westbound the two westbound lanes of river road there's no dotted line here this is merely a wide lane there would be room enough for two vehicles to go into that area but it is not a dotted line well now there is a dotted line for eastbound or in the eastbound lanes of river road west of the railroad track that's correct does that dotted line continue in that lane that eastbound lane east of the railroad tracks? No, sir. It doesn't? No, sir. So the only divided lanes in that intersection on River Road would be for the eastbound traffic west of the railroad? Correct. I think that's it. Thank you, sir. What is your first name? Leo, L-E-O. Leo, thank you. No redirect. Anything further, Mr. Geary? No, sir. And maybe let this witness be excused or stand by or what? Yes. May this witness be excused, Your Honor? You may be excused, Officer. Thank you. Call your next witness, Mr. Mullins. Uh, people call Mr. Takla. This is a Mr. Takla. Uh, yes, Your Honor. What is your first name? Benny. All right. Uh, spell the last name. Question by defense. Ladies and gentlemen, you are the judges of the credence of the witnesses in this case. It is now your duty to decide if there are some variances in the statements made by the witnesses while on the stand. You may consider as well any prior untrue remarks made by a witness in deciding the value or weight of his testimony. You may believe some of a person's testimony and not believe other parts of what he says. It is all up to you, members of the jury. If you find that a witness has testified falsely to one material fact in this case, you may disregard all of his testimony. Members of the jury, there are two types of evidence, direct and indirect or circumstantial. Direct evidence is that which proves a fact which is in dispute. It is evidence which proves it directly without an inference or presumption. It is evidence which, if it's true, proves the fact. Indirect evidence is evidence which tends to prove a fact in dispute by proving another fact. Indirect proof is of two kinds, namely inferences and presumptions. An inference is a deduction which you, the jury, draw from the facts proved. Now. <clears throat> A presumption is a deduction which the law directs to be made from a certain fact. An example of this is the presumption that a person is telling the truth. <clears throat> Unless it is declared by law to be conclusive, a presumption may be overcome by the other evidence. And this evidence may be direct or indirect. And then, unless it is overcome by other proof, the jury is bound to decide in accord with the presumption. Members of the jury, your own memory of the facts must always prevail. It must take precedence over what I recall or what I may say. I might possibly make an error without meaning to in stating the facts. It is true that I might forget something vital or something that you think is vital. Thus, you must trust your own memory. It is also your duty to decide what inferences you think are caused by the preponderance of the credible evidence. Your verdict here today must be unanimous. You must follow my charge as regarding the law. 
but you are the individuals to decide just what happened in this case. You must then reach a verdict without being swayed by pity or by bias. Your verdict must not be based on bias toward the plaintiff or the defendant or on any sort of bias. When the knowledge of a complex subject matter might be helpful to the jury, a person having special training or skill in that technical field, one who is called an expert witness, is allowed to state his or her opinion about those technical matters. Merely because an expert witness has stated an opinion, though, does not mean that you must accept that opinion. It's the same as with any other witness. It is up to you to decide to rely upon it or not. Ladies and gentlemen, you are the judges of the credence of the witnesses in this case. It is now your duty to decide if there are some variances in the statements made by the witnesses while on the stand. You may consider as well any prior untrue remarks made by a witness in deciding the value or weight of his testimony. You may believe some of a person's testimony and not believe other parts of what he says. It is all up to you, members of the jury. If you find that a witness has testified falsely to one material fact in this case, you may disregard all of his testimony. Members of the jury, there are two types of evidence, direct and indirect, and circumstantial. Direct evidence is that which proves a fact which is in dispute. It is evidence which proves it directly without an inference or presumption. It is evidence which, if it's true, proves the fact. Indirect evidence is evidence which tends to prove a fact in dispute by proving another fact. Indirect proof is of two kinds, namely inferences and presumptions. An inference is a deduction which you, the jury, draw from the facts proved. Now, a presumption is a deduction which the law directs to be made from a certain fact. An example of this is the presumption that a person is telling the truth. Unless it is declared by law to be conclusive, a presumption may be overcome by other evidence. This evidence may be direct or indirect. Then, unless it is overcome by other proof, the jury is bound to decide in accord with the presumption. Members of the jury, your own memory of the facts must always prevail. It must take precedence over what I recall or what I might say. I might possibly make an error without meaning to in stating the facts. It is true that I might forget something vital or something that you think is vital. Thus, you must trust your own memory. It is also your duty to decide what inferences you think are caused by the preponderance of the credible evidence. Your verdict here today must be unanimous. You must follow my charge as regarding the law. But you are the individuals to decide just what happened in this case. You must then reach a verdict without being swayed by pity or by bias. Your verdict must not be based on bias toward the plaintiff or the defendant or on any sort of bias. When the knowledge of a complex subject matter might be helpful to the jury, a person having special training or skill in that technical field, one who is called an expert witness is allowed to state his or her opinion about these technical matters. Merely because an expert witness has stated an opinion, though, does not mean that you must accept that opinion. It's the same as with any other witness. It is up to you to decide to rely upon it or not. Ladies and gentlemen, you are the judges of the credence of the witnesses in this case. It is now your duty to decide if there are some variances in the statements made by the witnesses while on the stand. You may consider as well any prior untrue remarks made by a witness in deciding the value or weight of his testimony. You may believe some of a person's testimony and not believe other parts of what he says. It is all up to you, members of the jury, if you find that a witness has testified falsely to one material fact in this case. You may disregard all of his testimony. Members of the jury, there are two types of evidence, direct and indirect or circumstantial. Direct evidence is that which proves a fact which is in dispute. It is evidence which proves it directly without an inference or presumption. It is evidence which, if it's true, proves the fact. Indirect evidence is evidence which tends to prove a fact in dispute by proving another fact. Indirect proof is of two kinds, namely inferences and presumptions. An inference is a deduction which you, the jury, draw from the facts proved. 
Now, a presumption is a deduction which the law directs to be made from a certain fact. An example of this is the presumption that a person is telling the truth. Unless it is declared by law to be conclusive, a presumption may be overcome by the other evidence. But this is evidence that may be direct or indirect. Then, unless it is overcome by other proof, the jury is bound to decide in accord with the presumption. Members of the jury, your own memory of the facts must always prevail. It must take precedence over what I recall or what I might say. I might possibly make an error without meaning to in stating the facts. It is true that I might forget something vital or something that you think is vital. Thus, you must trust your own memory. It is also your duty to decide what inferences you think are caused by the preponderance of the credible evidence. Your verdict here today must be unanimous. You must follow my charge as regarding the law. But you are the individuals to decide just what happened in this case. You must then reach a verdict without being swayed by pity or by bias. Your verdict must not be based on bias toward the plaintiff or the defendant or on any sort of bias. When the knowledge of a complex subject matter might be helpful to the jury, a person having special training or skill in that technical field, one who is called an expert witness, is allowed to state his or her opinion about those technical matters. Merely because an expert witness has stated an opinion, though, does not mean that you must accept that opinion. It's the same as with any other witness. It is up to you to decide to rely upon it or not. When knowledge of technical subject matter might be helpful to the jury, a person having some training or experience in that technical field, one who is called an expert witness, is allowed to state his or her view of those technical matters. Merely because an expert witness has expressed an opinion, however, does not mean that you should accept that opinion. So, just as with any other witness, it is up to you to decide whether to rely upon it and when an expert witness has been or will be paid for. Reviewing and speaking about the facts, you may view the idea of bias then where court testimony is given quite often and is a large part of the witness's income. Mr. Foster, I want to go back for a second to your conversation with Mr. Dorn. Excuse me for jumping back like this, but there is another question that I would like to ask you. When you talked to Mr. Dorn, didn't he tell you that, I am not trying to exactly quote him, but didn't he use words to this effect that you had an absolute right not to talk to the attorneys for Mrs. Heron and Mrs. Hamilton? You had the absolute right to talk to them, but the prosecutor preferred if you would not talk to us. Didn't he say something like that to you? <clears throat> no, sir. Now, let's go back to the area we were talking about just before the break, Mr. Foster. We were talking about principals making it difficult for teachers or other employees. You as principal of Vermont Avenue Elementary School was responsible, I take it, for evaluating all of the teachers? No. At that time, to evaluate the probationary teachers, the permanent teachers aren't evaluated once they become permanent. After a teacher becomes permanent, they never are again evaluated by a principal, not officially. Now they are. Since then, they pass what they call the stall bill. The stall bill was passed a year ago. All teachers are evaluated once a year. Probationary teachers continue to be evaluated twice a year. Before that, how often were permanent teachers evaluated? They weren't once they became permanent. We had our own evaluation that we could evaluate if we wished as principal. Now that would be more of a constructive type of evaluation. We would go into a room to see a lesson, have a meeting, discuss the lesson, and so forth. It was not a thing that was turned in on the permanent record unless, of course, it was unsatisfactory. If it was unsatisfactory, then it would be turned in on their permanent record. Well, there is a process there too. It wouldn't be turned in if it were one lesson that was unsatisfactory. Then you would go through the process of evaluating what the teacher is doing that isn't particularly affecting the children or get suggestions or get help coming in, counseling help, consultant help to help a teacher. It is only after you have worked with a teacher for a considerable length of time and she still does not change her method and her method can be proven to be ineffective. Then you might write up an unsatisfactory, but it is really 
You must give everything you have to make that teacher successful. You have hired her. With respect to probationary employees, employees who are not permanent, they were evaluated every year, I take it? Yes, sir. If you did not want to have a probationary employee at that school, could you tell the school board, well, I don't want them here. You will have to find another school for them. I have never done this, but I am saying that it is possible in the respect that they are not meeting the qualifications of that particular year of the probationary teacher. If there is something that you cannot redo or recycle as far as the teacher's performance is concerned, you would go through the same procedure as a permanent teacher and you may write an unsatisfactory. As far as having her transferred, I believe that was part of your question. To another school, I doubt very much if you could get a probationary transfer. You would have better luck with a permanent teacher being transferred, but you would have to really have an annotated record that she just could not make it in your school, and you would ask for permission from the superintendent if you could transfer, and that she might be successful in a different situation. Also, with respect to probationary employees, is it true that the principal has to personally approve those employees each year? Yes, sir. For them to remain at the school? Yes, sir. To remain with the district. The district employees writes the contract. I don't. The principal accepts the teacher when she comes in for an interview. I don't hire as such. She is already hired by the Board of Education of Los Angeles. However, in this case here, she is assigned to our school, or he is. You work with her to complete the probation. If you feel she can't complete probation, you can at that time say that you don't recommend her for probation. And then it is up to the district to write her off as it were. Does the principal play any role in the promotion of a classroom teacher, let's say to become a counselor or something like that? You are touching a couple of things here. As a counselor, no, the principal doesn't. The principal may get an evaluation form. Let's put it this way. When there is a promotional job, it is sent to all schools announcing that this job will be open and what qualifications are required. The person then goes to the place where you qualify. It may be downtown or in a field office the person applies to take the examination to qualify for this position. So the only thing that I, as principal, would have to do with it would be that the Board of Education would send me an evaluation form for the person working at my school and I would evaluate on that form. Did you, Mr. Foster, while you were at the Vermont Avenue School, and did you do all of the promotional evaluations for your permanent employees that got promotions? Objection, that still assumes facts not in evidence. Sustained, would you rephrase your question? Were there any permanent employees who received promotions while you were at Vermont Avenue School? Mr. Foster, yes, sir. Did you do their promotional evaluations? Yes, sir. So would it be fair to say then, Mr. Foster, in terms of the promotional evaluations of permanent employees and the evaluation of probationary employees that the principal of the school, such as you were, has a great deal of power over these people? Objection, the question has been asked and answered in regard to what he has over those individuals or what he does with those individuals, overruled, yes. Now, we have talked so far about teachers, probationary, and permanent. What about the education aides? Did you hire all of the education aides at Vermont Avenue School while you were there? In the final analysis, yes, sir. So any of those aides who were at Vermont Avenue School in 71-72 owed their jobs to you? Objection, Your Honor, it is vague. Owed their jobs to him. It is overruled. I suppose, one, they could say they owed it to me, yes. I okayed the evaluation of the committee that interviewed and presented the score of that person, the score they have for interviewing. The committee formed the list and I okayed the list. They owed their job to me only because I okayed the list. It was up to you as to whether or not they would be hired. Yes, sir. You made no suggestions or recommendations to the committee that did the interview as to who would be hired. No, sir. Did you sit in on this committee? Yes, there were two committees. Could you explain that? Yes, sir. 
When the advisory council met during the latter part of the year, or the first summer, we had gone into Title I very hurriedly. But we were the last school at that time chosen to participate in this program. We were not admitted to the program until almost June. We had that time to get our budget and so forth and hire the aides. We had met, decided on the number of aides we would need in order to give each teacher in the school an aide to cut down the teacher-pupil ratio. One of the criteria of selecting an aide is that it must be done with the representation from the community of a parent and one administrator. Okay, that's ready. And plaintiff's attorney is Mr. Molko, M-O-L-K-O, -O. okay? And, uh, let's see what else can I give you. Narcotic, F-A-A, F-C-C, -C, Burglary, Los Angeles Police Department, C-B, C period, B period, C-B guy, He's a CB guy. Radio. Narcotic detective. Cannery Street. C A N A R Y. In Costa Mesa. Okay, ready? 180. Starts with question by defense attorney. <clears throat> Your particular unit, the major narcotics unit, is it only you that uses this frequency? By you, I am talking about Los Angeles Police Department Narcotics Division, Major Violators Section Frequency. Okay, I understand that. Is it yours exclusively? Yes, I have never heard anybody else on that frequency besides major violators. In other words, you have never been out working and heard an officer talking on that unit who wasn't concerned with major narcotic crimes? That's correct. Okay. Now, so this must be assigned to you by somebody in the higher up or somebody who handles administration, right? Sir, I am sure the FAA or FCC assigns it and then it gets assigned to us. They don't privy me to that. Okay. Now, is there more than one channel on the unit you are using to converse back and forth with Mr. Hardin and the other detectives for that matter? There is only one channel, sir, so it is preset and you don't ever change it, is that correct? If I wanted to go to other handles, I would. I would if the situation presented itself to, but generally on surveillances, we use one channel, okay. And if you went to another channel, would you know how to get back to the channel that involves narcotics? Yes, sir, I would. Is that on a dial or buttons or what? It is, some have dials, others have buttons. Mine is a dial, okay. And would you dial a particular number? And I'm not going to ask you for the number, but let's assume you know that number. Do you punch it in or type it in or is it like a radio dial? Mine is a dial that you have to place on a certain number and then place another dial on another set of numbers. When you get those two numbers together, then you would be on our frequency. Is this a little more than just going around like a radio, you know, trying to pick up a channel or like, you know, people have CBs and they listen into police talk and stuff. Could a CB guy just dial along and pick that up? I am not familiar with CBs. I don't know, sir. So there is two dials, and the numbers that you put on have to be specifically matched before you can hear your other officers, right? Yes. And that hasn't changed for the last 11 or 12 years? Yes. The radios have changed. The heads of the radios have changed considerably. But that is only state of the art. Excuse me for just a moment. All right, excuse me. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Is the channel you use or this frequency, is it, in your opinion, a confidential channel? By that I mean, 
I am not sure exactly what I mean, excuse me. Is this channel's frequency known throughout the police department? Would a patrolman know what handle to use if he wanted to get in touch with a detective? For instance, who is investigating major narcotics? No, sir. They wouldn't have the frequency. They wouldn't know about it? I don't believe they would. It is a narcotics frequency. I mean, do you try to keep this number or numbers in confidence just between the narcotic detectives? Sir, I don't even know the number, so it is, I don't know how to answer that question. You mean you don't recall how many days you were actually involved in this surveillance, is that correct? No, I don't. Just approximately a two week period. Were you involved in a surveillance which led you to the area of Cannery Street in Costa Mesa? Yes. And were you following somebody? Yes, sir. Who were you following? At that time, a suspect, Perez. And do you recall what date that was? I believe that was a Saturday, about the 27th. Does that sound? Yes, that sounds about right. It sounds right. Were you and your fellow officers talking on the radio? Yes, as you approached here. I don't know. I was somewhat away from the surveillance at the time. There was a conversation on the radio. Do you recall how many cars were involved in the surveillance at that time when you were approaching Cannery following him? There were approximately five to six cars under surveillance. And when he is making turns, does somebody announce he is turning? Yes. Do they announce where somebody else should go? Or is there somebody directing all the cars or just, I am going to go this way. It is not really coordinated by one guy. What is stated is the man as we refer to as the point man states the direction of travel and the following vehicles take up other positions throughout the surveillance in order to either intercept or then become a point vehicle. They kind of try to maybe keep it like an envelope and he is enclosed, you know, north, south, front, maybe even ahead of him and behind him, on occasion up front, yes. Starts with the court. <clears throat> Ready? This is the matter of People versus Garcia. I see that counsel are present and the defendant is also present. And we were having cross examination of Officer Kearney, I believe. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. Uh, sir, you have seen this affidavit in support of the search warrant in this case, haven't you? Yes, I have, sir. Are you fairly familiar with its contents? I perused it about two weeks ago. That is the last time I have seen it, somewhat familiar. It gives the qualifications of Mr. Hardin here, his experience and expertise in the narcotics area, and a